Hey everyone, Adam Simmons here from DGTL Infra, short for Digital Infrastructure. It has been a back and forth between Crown Castle and Elliott Management over the past couple of months. In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the specific points of Elliott Management's plan for Crown Castle, the actions that Crown Castle has taken to date in response to Elliott's proposals, and how this debate could affect Crown Castle's stock price going forward. Again, you might actually be able to make some money off of Elliott's work without having to invest a billion dollars of your own money, so stay tuned and I'll break this all down for you. Before I do, be sure to subscribe to the DGTL Infra channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss my next in-depth video that is coming out soon. Now, let's jump into the video. Okay, so now, as you'll recall from the past video, Elliott Management took a $1 billion economic interest in Crown Castle and released a presentation and letter at reclaimingthecrown.com targeting Crown Castle's capital allocation strategy after first approaching the company privately with its plan in May 2020. On the page here, we see Elliott Management's four-step plan for Crown Castle rectifying what it perceives as issues. The first point of Elliott's plan is that fiber is the reason for Crown Castle's stock market underperformance compared to peers. Elliott recommends fiber and small cells to have their capital expenditures reduced to increase unlevered free cash flow by 35%. So Elliott believes here that Crown Castle's consistent underperformance is directly attributable to the company's fiber strategy which has yielded disappointing returns despite $16 billion of investment, which includes both organic investments for developing out new fiber networks and acquiring other fiber companies. In short, Crown Castle's fiber strategy has been dilutive to its tower return profile. Elliott believes that Crown Castle should refocus fiber spend on its higher return opportunities and target fiber capital expenditures as a percentage of revenue of at least a 40% return on investment or ROI, which means effectively every investment has a two year payback for fiber. Elliott stipulates that Crown Castle has spent relatively more on fiber capital expenditures than the typical fiber company. Think Zayo, Cogent Communications, or Light Tower, which Crown Castle previously acquired. And this has resulted in negative free cash flow which is defined as EBITDA less capital expenditures, and lower returns on investment for Crown Castle relative to peers. By limiting discretionary fiber capital expenditures to $600 million annually in the future, as compared to $1.4 billion in 2019, or Crown Castle's run rate of about $1.2 billion for 2020, then Crown Castle could have more cash freed up for things like a higher dividend payout. In summary, the first point is Elliott is not against Fiber's merits as an asset class, but rather their issue is more focused on Crown Castle investing too much in Fiber, a low returning asset which the market underappreciates, with minimal proven returns historically to justify Crown Castle further investing in the asset. Elliott wants Crown Castle to shift fiber investment to higher return on invested capital projects, suggesting lower investment on small cells. Now let's try to frame out point one with a concrete example of how Crown Castle could pursue a way in which may appease some of Elliott's concerns. So the capital intensity on lease up of an existing fiber asset is substantially lower than initial fiber build outs. What are called anchor builds. The capital expenditures involved in lease up is much lower because it involves building from a dark fiber run, a lateral into a building, or adding a splice point along the way to get into those buildings. Therefore, there is some capital required, but it is substantially less than the initial build, and it is certainly at much higher margins. The capital intensity can be brought down by Crown Castle as the company finishes its large dark fiber anchor builds and begins pivoting to lease up. And the company did highlight this on their Q3 2020 earnings call, which took place on October 22nd. 
The second point from Elliot's plan really focuses on how Crown Castle should be incorporating Return on Invested Capital, or ROIC, into its management incentive plan. Elliot no longer wants to have what is called misaligned incentives. It wants to appropriately align capital allocation decisions with management compensation. Crown Castle executives are currently measured on adjusted EBITDA and adjusted funds from operation, or AFFO, per share, neither of which includes discretionary capital expenditures in their calculations. Elliot thinks that aligning management compensation with improving return on invested capital, or ROIC, will result in better shareholder outcomes. The third point of Elliot's plan is to increase the dividend in order to enhance returns. By reallocating savings from capital expenditures towards an enhanced dividend, Crown Castle could fund a greater dividend per share. Under Elliott's plan, Crown Castle's dividend per share in 2021 would be $7 per share, growing to above $8 of dividends per share by 2023. And this compares to about a $4.90 run rate for dividends for 2020. And if we look at the implied growth rate that that means for Crown Castle's dividend under the Elliott plan from $7 per share in 2021 to above $8 per share in 2023, it's implying approximately a 7 to 8% growth rate in dividends per year under Elliott's plan, which is an attractive growth rate for shareholders. The fourth and final pillar of Elliott's plan is to improve oversight at the board of directors level. Elliot believes that there's insufficient oversight, and Elliot's letter argues that Crown Castle should address its long-tenured board to improve oversight of capital allocation. Elliot noted that 50% of Crown Castle's board have a tenure of more than 15 years, and 8 of the 11 non-executive directors of the 12-member board have a tenure of at least 13 years. Finally, Crown Castle should ensure that the fiber business has the appropriate, quote, management skill set to deliver improved results. So now we know a little bit about Crown Castle's view of its business. We know some of the characteristics of the different pieces of digital infrastructure being debated here, whether that be towers, fiber, and small cells, which was referred to in the prior video. And now we have Elliot's four-point plan for what they think should be changed at Crown Castle. So the real question here is how this debate could unfold. So thinking in terms of strategy, Crown Castle has made a significant $16 billion cumulative investment in amassing this scaled portfolio of high-quality fiber. Additionally, Crown Castle has conviction for small cell returns being high, which the company believes are at an inflection point of materializing in a 5G world. Because of these two factors, Crown Castle is not likely to meaningfully change its fiber and small cell capital allocation strategy near term. If we think about who the main customer of small cells for Crown Castle has been to date, it has been Verizon. Given that they have deployed significantly more high band millimeter wave spectrum for 5G as compared to the other US carriers like AT&T and T-Mobile. T-Mobile and AT&T will have greater lease-up potential for small cell assets in the future as they too deploy millimeter wave spectrum for 5G. As a side note, if you want to learn more about millimeter wave spectrum and 5G, please visit us at dgtlinfra.com where we break down how the different layers of 5G spectrum are being deployed and how this affects the different tower companies like American Tower and Crown Castle. With this backdrop in mind, Crown Castle believes it is well equipped to leverage towers, fiber, and small cells as important components of digital infrastructure in the 5G ecosystem. So in terms of strategy, it's pretty clear where Crown Castle stands. In terms of dividend, Crown Castle currently has a framework to pay out approximately 75% of annual adjusted funds from operation per share, or AFFO per share, as dividends. Further, Crown Castle already has a higher dividend yield of about 3% compared to Peer's American Tower at 2% and SBA Communications at 1%. And then more recently on Crown Castle's Q3 2020 earnings call, the company did raise its dividend per share by 11%, further increasing the gap between peers. 
Finally, on the right side of the page, you can see a sale or a spin-off of the fiber segment could also be possible. However, this could prove disruptive and more costly than any value created by Crown Castle doing this. In this scenario, it's unrealistic to think that Crown Castle could attain greater than a 16 times EBITDA multiple in a sale or spin-off scenario, which actually represents the average of what Crown Castle has paid for its five different fiber acquisitions historically, so wouldn't be recouping any more than it has invested. I've excerpted on this page some of the recent fiber transaction multiples that Elliot thought were relevant to compare Crown Castle to, which reinforces my prior point. Just to note about this slide, the purple bars are the assets in which Crown Castle purchased as an acquirer. The purple line represents the average of the transaction multiples that Crown Castle paid over its historical period. And the orange line represents a material lower transaction multiple, which Zeo, which was formerly public, paid during its time as a public company when rolling up other fiber companies. While certain fiber M&A deals have traded at 16 times plus EBITDA, including assets like Summit IG at 22 times EBITDA and Everstream at 17 and a half times EBITDA, these premiums have been paid for smaller regional fiber networks growing significantly faster than Crown Castle's fiber portfolio. Compared to fiber M&A deals of greater than $500 million in transaction value where Crown Castle was not the buyer, the majority of deals traded well below 16 times EBITDA. Including in May 2019, Digital Colony and EQT acquired Zeo Group for $14.3 billion, equating to an 11 times EBITDA multiple. You can see this under Zeo in the middle of the page. In February 2018, GTT Communications acquired Interroot for $2.3 billion, equating to an 11 times EBITDA multiple. And in November 2016, Zeo Group acquired Electric Lightwave, formerly Integra, from Searchlight Capital Partners for $1.4 billion, equating to a 7.9 times EBITDA multiple. You can see both of the Interroot and Electric Lightwave, which is on the page as ELI, and how they fit into the various fiber transaction multiples paid. And as a side note, for our full list of precedent fiber transactions, visit the premium content section at dgtlinfra.com to get full access to fiber transactions dating back to 2015. Disappointed by Crown Castle's progress since Elliot's first presentation, letter, and discussions with management, Elliot issued follow up letters, as seen here, on July 20th and August 17th, proposing the following framework. First, Elliot wanted Crown Castle to propose a fiber segment five year plan. In this plan, fiber segment financial metrics, including revenue, gross margin, segment profit, discretionary capital expenditures, enterprise fiber and small cell revenue, and capital expenditure mix, and a bifurcation of small cell anchor build and co location capital expenditures, would be provided by Crown Castle. Elliott highlighted that Crown Castle has repeatedly missed fiber revenue targets, repeatedly missed small cell node goals, and has had a consistently declining return on invested capital, or ROIC. Elliott's second point in the new framework was to have quarterly key performance indicators for the fiber segment. Metrics cited include new bookings and associated capital expenditures, installations, churn, upfront cash payments, capital expenditures segmented by payback period, all reported separately for small cells and enterprise fiber. This would give investors like Elliot more comfort on analyzing the small cell and fiber business with more data to use. Finally, the third point was a small cell cohort analysis. Elliot wanted Crown Castle to provide small cell investments by year of deployment, including capital invested, fiber route miles, number of nodes, small cell revenue, and enterprise revenue for that system. So in summary, Elliot clearly not pleased at the pace of progress in which Crown Castle was making changes, and even to the Q3 2020 earnings release, which was on October 22nd, Crown Castle has not implemented any of these changes, so likely more to come from Elliot on these matters.
Okay, so now in the next few pages, we'll discuss the actions that Crown Castle has taken in response to its engagement with Elliott Management. And this has included a number of additional disclosures, some analysis, but as we mentioned before, not up to the standard in which Elliott was looking for. But nonetheless, let's dive in and see what Crown Castle has made available. So as we can see from this page, Crown Castle made a number of additional disclosures for their fiber solutions and small cell segments, including a revenue breakout of each. So as we can see from the three months ended September 30th, 2020, Fiber Solutions comprises approximately 323 million of revenue and Small Cells comprises 139 million of revenue. In terms of overall makeup of Crown Castle's total revenue, Fiber comprises 22% of total revenue and Small Cells make up 9.5% of total revenue. In addition, you can see from the bottom half of the page, Crown Castle broke out its Fiber Solutions revenue mix by customer type, with the composition of revenue being the following. 40% from carriers, think AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. 13% from education providers. 10% from healthcare. 10% from financial services. And the remaining 27% from other types of companies. Additionally, Crown Castle decided to provide segment cash yields on invested capital for both its tower and fiber segment. This gives investors a view in terms of the return on invested capital, or ROIC, by segment, which in Q3 2020, as you can see from the bottom half of the page with the numbers circled, was 10.7% for its tower segment and 7.8% for its fiber segment. As a comparison, in Q2 2020, Return on invested capital by segment was 10.4% for towers, which is approximately 30 basis points lower, and 7.6% for its fiber segment, which is approximately 20 basis points lower. So you can see quarter over quarter improvement, albeit a small bump from Q2 to Q3. One of the new disclosures which Crown Castle really wanted to highlight during its Q2 2020 earnings call was a fiber market cohort analysis as you see on the page. Crown Castle provided additional visibility into how its investments into fiber and small cells are progressing in five distinct markets. It identified this through five case studies of these distinct markets for fiber and small cells to provide a representation of how their overall fiber and small cell strategy is performing over time. Each market you see here is different when it comes to the scale of the investment, the revenue mix between small cells and fiber solutions, the node density, and the contribution from acquisitions. If we go through some of the items on the page, we can note that the dashed blue line is the initial acquired yield, where in certain markets, Crown Castle has made an acquisition in the past of a fiber company. The cash yield, which is the current yielding amount for that particular market, and the nodes per mile, which is a signification of the density of small cells in that particular market. Moving into the box, we can see invested capital, which ranges from 1.4 billion in Los Angeles all the way down to less than 100 million in Phoenix, Arizona. And then the route miles, the weighted average life of the investment, providing ideas about how different markets at different levels of maturity, for example, Denver at three years or Phoenix at six years, compare in different metrics, the number of on air nodes in each market. And then moving down to the pie charts on the bottom half of the page, the revenue mix for each market in terms of small cells contribution and fiber solutions. And then at the very bottom, percentage co-location of on-air nodes between anchor and co-location. So how is the revenue being contributed in that market? For example, Los Angeles is very weighted towards being anchor-led, whereas Philadelphia is more on the co-location side. So let's discuss some of the commentary on each of the five markets in more detail. Los Angeles provides evidence of Crown Castle's acquisition strategy, since more than 70% of the capital there is associated with several acquisitions, including NextG, Sunesis, and Wilcon, at an initial return of less than 6%. Since the time of acquisition, Crown Castle has added more than 200 basis points of yield to the overall invested capital base by adding customers and cash flow to the 6,700 route miles of fiber, with most of the growth coming from adding small cell customers. Philadelphia is also encouraging, 
with a current yield of about 10% as a result of combining fiber solutions and small cells on the same assets, which gives Crown Castle an opportunity to meaningfully increase returns as it continues to add small cells to the fiber over time. Denver is a market where Crown Castle's nodes per mile is the highest, at 3.8. However, the majority of the investment activity to date has been focused on anchor builds for small cell customers. Denver's 5.5% yield is lower than Crown Castle would typically expect from small cell anchor builds due to some higher costs that were incurred during construction which were beyond what the company had initially underwrote for that deal. Moving to Phoenix, which generates nearly 12% returns and is higher than what Crown Castle would typically expect with a node density of just under two nodes per mile. But Phoenix's returns are primarily driven by co-location that has occurred in that market. Finally, Orlando is a market where Crown Castle made its first investment in its small cell strategy more than 10 years ago. Crown Castle built this initial system for one carrier and was able to subsequently lease it up to other carriers over time. The initial system has also benefited from both amendments and increased density for evolving technologies. Orlando provides a clear example of what a fully leased up or stabilized market can produce in terms of financial results. Capital which Crown Castle invested in Orlando now yields nearly 20% which is where the company believes all markets can reach once the level of lease-up accelerates in the future. So after reviewing Crown Castle's five case studies, it's worth critiquing Crown Castle's disclosure from a third-party perspective, and not just relying on the company's commentary for analysis. So Elliot noted that Orlando is a market where less than 1% of fiber capital, or only 100 million, has been spent, and thus it is not a credible demonstration that Crown Castle's fiber and small cell strategy as a whole is on track. Elliot posits that the company's reliance on such snapshots is further evidence that Crown Castle either does not have comprehensive data or does not like its conclusions. It's worth noting that cities with a significant enterprise fiber mix of revenue which you can see from the top pie charts on the bottom half of the page, cities like Los Angeles and Philadelphia were acquired markets where enterprise revenue was already part of the mix. Conversely, Denver, Phoenix, and Orlando were built organically and have effectively no enterprise revenue, reinforcing where Crown Castle is focusing its efforts. Crown Castle on its Q2 2020 earnings call also tried to frame out how the small cell market opportunity was unfolding in their view. Crown Castle referenced market research as seen on the left side of the page that noted an outlook for between 980,000 and 1.1 million small cells on air by 2024, which could suggest significant upside from the approximately 200,000 small cells that are deployed across the United States today. For Crown Castle's fiber and small cell business, 1 million small cells by 2024 would be a big boost to the overall market size. However, even if 1 million small cells are not deployed by 2024, there will nonetheless be a significant growth opportunity for Crown Castle. Let's take an example customer. T-Mobile has stated publicly that it will likely need 40 to 50,000 outdoor small cells once it fully builds out its 5G network and is about double the 20 to 25,000 which T-Mobile has on air today. Moving to the right side of the page, Crown Castle assumes that two to three small cell nodes per mile is adequate in a 4G LTE environment for one anchor tenant, as you can see from the light blue slice at the bottom of the page. And Crown Castle believes it is mere building blocks on top of one another that adds additional nodes to the network. So further, one additional tenant is assumed to be added over a 10-year period, meaning another two to three small cell nodes per mile is added to the network, and still assuming only 4G LTE needs. And you can see that from 4G tenant 2. Further, 4G tenant 3 is added, adding another two to three nodes. However, 5G has the potential to drive network densities well beyond Crown Castle's underwriting assumptions. Considering the combination of 5G network requirements and the higher spectrum bands that will be available to meet future mobile demand, Crown Castle believes node densities approaching 
20 small cell nodes per mile could represent an achievable upside scenario long term. And you get there by adding 5G tenant 2 and 5G tenant 3, both at 5 to 6 nodes each. Crown Castle also tried to frame out the small cell risk reward opportunity by presenting an illustrative upside and downside scenario for small cell node densities, which could result in seven times potential upside relative to potential downside, a compelling risk reward for investors. The purple line on this graph is an illustrative representation of possible total shareholder value in 10 years' time. It is assumed that small cell node densities increase from less than two nodes per mile to seven nodes per mile as you move from left to right on the chart. The light green shaded area on the chart illustrates where Crown Castle could be on that curve if the company sustains the current growth profile of the business, which can be achieved based on 4G LTE network densities. As small cell densities increase, moving left to right, Crown Castle's small cell strategy could result in value for shareholders being four times higher in 10 years, assuming seven small cell nodes per mile on average. Ultimately, 5G densities could present requirements for significantly more than seven small cell nodes per mile on average, and potentially approaching upwards of 20 nodes per mile over the long term, as discussed on the prior page. Going from right to left, if the current volume and mix of small cell co-location activity does not increase from the current levels and fiber solutions growth were to decelerate, Crown Castle believes the potential downside is fairly muted, indicated by the red portion of the graph. Crown Castle has tremendous growth runway in small cells should the forecasts for 1 million small cells by 2024 and higher small cell node densities come to fruition. Stepping back, as of Q3 2020, Crown Castle had 48,000 small cells on air, with the company's goal to have 50,000 small cells on air by the end of 2020. Furthermore, the company has 20,000 small cells in its backlog, which should support similar small cell growth of 10,000 nodes or greater in 2021, to have approximately 60,000 small cells on air by the end of 2021. So now I wanted to revisit Elliot's four-step plan for Crown Castle to hit on a couple other items which Crown Castle has taken in terms of actions in response to engagement with Elliot. Crown Castle has amended its corporate governance guidelines to institute a mandatory board retirement policy whereby non-employee directors over the age of 72 will not be nominated going forward. This implies that five of the 12 board members that are currently on the board will be leaving through 2022. The board of directors has also approved a plan for five current directors to transition by May 2022. Three current directors will not be nominated for re-election at the 2021 annual shareholders meeting, and two current directors will not be nominated for re-election at the 2022 annual shareholders meeting, at which time a new independent board chair will be selected. Crown Castle also announced an executive compensation program review considering additional performance metrics to evaluate management by, the outcome of which has not been determined at this point. And finally, Crown Castle announced in August 2020 that its chief operating officer of Fiber, Jim Young, would be retiring, and Crown Castle plans to search both internally and externally for his replacement. At the time of Q3 2020 earnings, Crown Castle was still engaged in the process of seeking their Fiber head's replacement. And it's worth reiterating now what Crown Castle is not presently pursuing as part of Elliott's plan recommendations. So first, to substantially reduce fiber capital expenditure to focus on 40% plus ROI projects Crown Castle is not agreeing with. And two, to reallocate cash flow towards a dividend of $7 per share Crown Castle has not done. As of Q3 2020 earnings, they raised their dividend by 11%, but is still materially below the $7 per share. Crown Castle's annual dividend going forward will now be $5.32 per share. So now to add some color as to what Crown Castle's rationale is for disagreeing with certain points on Elliott Management's plan. Crown Castle states that the 40% return on fiber capital expenditures would limit the company's strategy 
to solely enterprise fiber solutions within its existing footprint. The pivot would eliminate the primary driver of future value in the fiber strategy, which is co-location builds on small cells, which represent, in Crown Castle's view, the best opportunity to drive the strongest returns. Crown Castle will spend capital on an enterprise fiber deal only if that fiber can eventually benefit small cells as well. So clearly Crown Castle is not keen on investing in enterprise fiber, but we can take the opposite view and understand why investors may want them to do so because the enterprise fiber return on invested capital is closer to 25% to 33% on an annualized basis, which equates to approximately a three to four year payback period, which is attractive, but clearly not a focus for management currently. Finally, Crown Castle is not yet at the point of focusing primarily on co-location builds, which is when capital expenditures would begin to decline relative to growth and yields would increase from the 6 to 7% range to the 20 to 30% range going forward. And then Crown Castle made a few additional changes on its Q3 2020 earnings call on October 22nd, which helped to bridge the bid and the ass between Elliott and Crown Castle. So Crown Castle increased its annualized common stock dividend by 11% to $5.32 per share, which equates to about a 3.3% dividend yield on the closing stock price of Crown Castle on the day of the conference call. Looking to 2021, the portion of Crown Castle's small cell backlog that the company expects to put on air has a higher proportion of co-location nodes relative to recent years, reducing the capital intensity of that business. Due to this reduced capital intensity, combined with the completion of several large fiber expansion projects in 2020, Crown Castle expects its discretionary capital expenditures to be 400 million lower in 2021 when compared to 2019. Crown Castle also announced that as part of its previously announced board refreshment plan, that its board of directors has appointed two new directors, effective November 6, 2020. Tammy K. Jones, CEO of Basis Investment Group, a multi-strategy commercial real estate investment manager, and Matthew Thornton III, former Chief Operating Officer of FedEx Freight, will both shortly join the Crown Castle board. Furthermore, Crown Castle also intends to add a third director with previous experience in the fiber industry to help give that business more oversight. Finally, as all of this debate has been going on between Crown Castle and Elliott Management, what's been happening in the background is sophisticated private equity and infrastructure funds have been thinking of how they can potentially provide a solution for this dilemma themselves. And that's exactly what we see here, where on August 26th, Reuters reported that Colony Capital, through its Digital Colony Partners One Fund, had contacted Crown Castle to indicate its interest in purchasing a minority stake in Crown Castle's fiber business. Digital Colony had proposed that Crown Castle keep its investment in fiber but bring in an additional partner into a joint venture structure. It's worth noting that Colony Capital owns a significant interest in Zeo, which was taken private earlier this year, which is a comparable business on the fiber side to Crown Castle's fiber segment. Following these reports, Crown Castle indicated that it sees no rationale to raising equity in its fiber or small cell business, given that it does not need additional equity capital. Furthermore, Private equity capital is expensive, targeting returns of 20% plus per annum, and given Crown Castle's low borrowing rates, the company achieved less than 3.5% for 30 years on a recent debt issuance, that the company is likely to continue to self-fund its capital expenditure needs in the future. So any short-term valuation mark on the fiber and small cell business from an equity investor would likely be offset by the long-term drag of having minority shareholders in the business. Well, now that wraps up our two-part series on the engagement between Crown Castle and Elliott Management's $1 billion economic investment in the company. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, then please share it with somebody you think might also find it helpful. If you missed part one of the series, the links are down below in the description, or I'll link to them coming up on screen. And consider subscribing to DGTL Infra and visit us at dgtlinfra.com for more of the latest news on digital infrastructure. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like the video and post in the comments telling me about whether you think Crown Castle should be following Elliot's plan or not.
Thanks again for watching, and I will see you in the next video.